Alberta has voted and the results are in. Well, sort of. Uh, the results are in as of this point of recording, but still many rural municipalities still have to report their results. But here's what we know so far. About 60% of Albertans want equalization stripped from the Canadian Constitution. About half and half want daylight savings time adopted all year round, meaning no more adjusting your clocks. And the three new senators elected are Pam Davidson, Erica Baruts, and Mihailo Martinuk. So what exactly am I talking about? Well, Alberta recently held municipal elections and concurrently the government put a referendum and Senate elections to voters both of which may sound foreign to those in other provinces who can't recall the last time they participated in a referendum or that Senate elections are actually a thing in Canada. Aren't all senators appointed? Isn't it the United States of America where the senators are elected by the people? So what becomes of the elected senators? And what do the results of Alberta's referendum mean for Albertans and for Canadians? Will Alberta's equalization arrangement with Ottawa be changing in the near future? Or was this merely symbolic? Will Alberta start a provincial trend in abandoning daylight savings time? Well, joining me now to unpack it all is Danielle Smith, uh, former politician, president of the Alberta Enterprise Group and host of the Danielle Smith Report right here on the News Forum. And also joining us is Mike Donison, lawyer and senior policy advisor for legislation and democratic reform to the government house leader under the Harper government. Thank you both so much for joining me today. No, my pleasure. Okay, so lots, to be here. Yeah, lots to discuss here. So maybe I'll start with you, Mike. Um, why does Alberta have referenda? What is the history here? Well, the history for Alberta goes back to 1913. It goes back to the, the notion in the West, the concept of direct democracy. Now, a lot of people think referendum are foreign to our British parliamentary system, right? We have elected legislative bodies. But referendum is actually a little more frequent in Canada than you think. Uh, the first referendum on the federal level was in 1898 on prohibition. There was a referendum on conscription in 1942. Um, there was uh, the two referendums in Quebec, 1980, 1995, on, on whether Quebec should leave the Federation. There was the famous Charlottetown Accord. Mm -hmm. That was a referendum all Canadians voted in in 1992. Uh, Newfoundland joined Confederation only after a series of two referendums. I mean, I can go on and on. Referendums are not usual but they're not as foreign to the system as people might think. But particularly, it's, it's, it's in Western Canada where it's been most popular, Alberta and to a certain extent, BC. So in 1913, Alberta brought in the Direct Democracy Act. And uh, they've had seven referendums. I think this is the eighth one okay. uh, in, in Alberta's history. BC also has a referendum uh, legislation as well. It's hardly ever been used. Uh, to my knowledge, no other provinces have referendum legislation. Hmm. And then there's the Federal Referendum Act as well. Well, I, They're not usually used, but they can be used from time to time. Well, I live, I reside in Ontario, and, uh, and as, as many of our viewers probably do as well, uh, you know, I'm kind of getting a little jealous here. I kind of want a referendum. I want this direct democracy. So is there any uh, hope in the cards for the rest of us provinces and territories who don't have this? I doubt it. Okay, well, thanks for bursting that bubble. Um, so... <laughs> How is a referendum triggered? I mean, I can ask Mike, but um, Alison, if you want to chime in, by all means. How is a referendum triggered? How does that process get in, go going? It's funny. Well, you called me Alison. I think you must have had Alison Redford on uh, in, in your mind. mind. Oh, my goodness. Danielle Smith. My goodness, Danielle. My goodness, okay. Danielle. I, I'm so sorry. That a lot. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know, it's funny because I seem to think it's, it's strange to me to hear Mike talking because I kind of think of referenda as being such a, a common part of our political life here. I've seen referenda in my time, not only on Charlottetown, but also on VLTs, whether they should be in communities. Calgary, for some reason, continues to have referenda on fluoride. And this was no exception this time around. But one of the things that Premier Jason Kenney did when he came in is he's created an avenue for citizen-initiated referenda. So I think the rest of the country should pay attention to that because that's going to become a lot more common. He's created an avenue. If somebody is bent out of shape about an issue, that they can get enough petition signatures and then be able to put it on the ballot. And so we will have two opportunities for referenda in conjunction with the municipal election, in conjunction with the federal election, and as a standalone. And this is not just unique to one political party. In fact, when Calgary was considering having the Olympics uh, as a condition for provincial funding, NDP Premier Rachel Notley said, we're not going to give any money until you can prove in a referenda that people actually want it. And so I think that there's some acceptance on both sides of the aisle that sometimes on big issues, not on every little thing, 
but on on big issues and ones that keep on coming up like fluoride, I'm shrugging my shoulders on that one. Those are the <laughs> ones that get put to the people. Yep.